you all know we're going to be recording this meeting so that everyone uh, who can't make it tonight is able to to watch it later and that we can post it more publicly so um just all know that recording is happening so welcome to our community meeting i'm going to hand this over to steven to really kick us off but wanted to make sure we had consent for recording first Sure. Good evening, everybody. Uh, I'm Stephen Tuttle, uh, project manager for the Receipt Park uh, development. And I apologize, I can't get my camera to work uh, currently, but um, I'll just talk my way through it here. Um, excited to be with you tonight. Um, you, I will share my screen in just a second, and uh, we'll go over the agenda and where we're going tonight. Um, yeah, Jen, why don't you take it away from there? Wonderful, thank you so much for the community meeting about Racing Park. We're really excited to uh, provide you some wonderful project updates, um, tell you the development since our last public meeting, um, and then hold some space at the end to hear your questions, concerns, and, and the issues that we need to have for future consideration. Um, so I wanna just kind of orient us to what we'll be doing with our time tonight. Um, I'm gonna go through just a couple slides that give you um, both some online meeting protocols and just give you an idea Jen of- and Ivan for starters. Oh. Sorry, go ahead. Um, so we're just gonna kind of give you give you some level set about the meeting um, and then we'll go straight into this those project overviews and updates. Um, and then we'll talk a little bit more specifically about the updates to the playground design. Um, and then like I mentioned, open up some time for Q and A. Um, so if you wouldn't mind going to the next slide. Um, so our purpose in gathering here tonight is really to be able to share some of the progress and the updates to give the community an update as well as to have that two-way communication. Make sure that uh, your project team here is able to listen to community feedback um, and to provide any additional information that, that you might need about this uh, lovely project. So just a few kind of meeting level sets. Um, it's easiest for us if you can add a comment in chat and then we can make sure that we can elevate um, your question or your comment um, that way. What we're gonna do is make sure that we wait until the end of the session after the end of the presentation to have that Q&A because you may have a question that then gets answered in a later slide. So we just wanna make sure that everyone has the same information before we have a, have a dialogue. Um, when we have the opportunity for Q&A, um, you'll have the chance to turn on your microphone when you're invited to speak. If you are calling in from the phone, you can push star six to mute and unmute yourself. Um, one thing is it's easiest for us if you'd like to make a comment, you can either put your name in the chat or you can use the raise hand function. That'll uh, signal for us that you would like a chance to speak. And then I'll just call out your name and that'll give you the opportunity. Just as a caveat, I wanna apologize. Um, I'm reading the names that are here on Zoom. And if I mispronounce your name, um, I apologize in advance, it's not, not uh, because of bad intentions. I, I just have trouble reading names on the fly sometimes. So hopefully uh, we'll be able to understand who's next and uh, who would like to speak. Um, just to also level set kind of our agreements while we're in community here, we wanna be really respectful of all views um, and opinions. We're not really here to have a debate. We're just here to receive and provide information. Um, so we wanna just do that in a respectful way. One of the things that'll really ha uh, help us is if you keep your mics muted, that way we don't have any background noise until it is uh, your turn to speak. And we're just gonna try and limit one person speaking at a time. Um, and then our third one is a great one is uh, to think about allowing others to speak uh, once before you speak twice. So we wanna make sure that we get engagement um, from all of our participants. And so if you can just um, step back and allow uh, other questions that will, will help us make sure that we hear from everybody. Great, and then I'll hand it over for uh, a project overview with Stephen. All right, great, thank you, Jen. Um, happy to be with you tonight and uh, give you an update on where the, the project's at. So let's, let's um, jump in here. Okay, so as a reminder, um, the intent of this park development is really focused on the active recreational use of the project um, and the athletic fields are the priority for the project. And tonight we're gonna to talk about some of the um, additional features that have been considered along the way, which will be, I think, a really fun conversation. Um, you can see that the property has been held by the city for uh, about 25 years. And so it's exciting to see that it's, um, the development is happening on it currently. Here's a project timeline. Um, 
throughout the summer, uh, we were doing the schematic design and we met with uh, several of you throughout that time to um, refine the design. And then we've been developing the design um, in the winter here. And um, we will be resubmitting for land use review in a couple of weeks here um, as we sort of uh, collect some miscellaneous information along the way. Some of that we'll talk about tonight here. Um, and then uh, the process is really, we go in for land use review, and then that'll allow us to start to focus on how we actually build this thing and um, tighten the screws on the, the design and construction of it. And uh, we'll be looking at sending out for permit and bidding later in the summer, and then um, building this, uh, hopefully kicking off next fall and into the following spring. So that's the updated timeline. The schedule slowed down a little bit. Um, and some of the reasons for that are uh, just some of the good feedback we've had along the way over the last several months. Um, one, in relation to traffic, and um, two, in relationship to the, the skate park, which um, you probably have all heard about, and I'll give a brief update about here as well. On the left, you can see the different meetings that we've had to date. Um, this is our second community meeting. Uh, we've had uh, a handful of um, advisory committee meetings uh, uh, with stakeholders from uh, throughout the city that have been helping guide us along the way and a couple of neighborhood meetings as well. So um, today you can see on the right, we're at, at the community meeting and then there's a, a meeting coming up uh, in a couple of months uh, for the, um, the city, the DRC, and we'll review the plans again with the city one more time. Okay, no doubt you've heard um, this park project is welcoming in a skate park. Um, so that's new since uh, October, the last time we chatted. Um, and so I want to I want to talk a little bit about that, and um, and give you an update on that. So why a skate park? A um, couple of things came to bear since October. Uh, one was a really strong level of support for a skate park from the youth, and uh, they really uh, had a great voice to um, bring that to the fore of the city's um, uh, interest. And uh, secondly or I'm saying these backwards here and the, the bullet points here, but secondly, the, um, uh, the park system within Lake Oswego uh, doesn't have any skate parks. There's no place to, to do skateboarding um, uh, intentionally. And so by providing that, it really gives people that enjoy skating a place to do that. And this uh, project has a great opportunity to do that. So with those things in mind, the city council um, uh, uh, voted to uh, move forward with the skate park um, component of this park. So obviously there's probably a lot of questions that come with that. And this is where I, I punt to Kira, who's on the phone with us today on the, the, pre the, the call. Um, and she is gonna be heading up the development of the skate park uh, component. It's really a project within a project. We're not gonna talk about it really today or focus on it because it's on a separate tract. It has a separate public involvement process. Um, and uh, all things skate park will, will be happening in a different arena, so to speak. So, but what I can tell you is it's gonna be um, in the area circled in red there in the Northeast corner of the property. It'll be about 10,000 square feet. And what goes in it, uh, we're not sure yet. Um, that's going to come out of that first public meeting that you see on your screen right there, um, which is coming up on Saturday, April 2nd. And so it's a great opportunity if you're interested in the skate park, um, I'd encourage you to attend that meeting um, and get a, uh, have a chance to hear what's going on with that and make some suggestions for the skate park itself. Um, that'll be followed up by the second one that you see there uh, a month downstream where the skate park consultant will come back with uh, sort of a concept for people to, to respond to. So you can see there's a website there as well. So anything, um, uh, current about the skate park can be found there and I encourage you to go there. Second, um, quick update on traffic. Um, I know there's been a lot of interest and, and concern about the ability of Stafford and the roundabout to handle um, the traffic that's gonna be generated potentially by this park and the other projects uh, just to the north of the, the rec center. Um, and so driven by those community and neighborhood comments, the city um, has taken a fresh look at the traffic counts and the impacts um, that will happen to the roundabout from these projects. And so the city has really heard the concerns that, from the neighborhood 
and the people um, interested in, in how the traffic flow is gonna, gonna happen around this park and um, have been in conversations with the county and the traffic consultant. Um, and they have uh, been taking a fresh look at the, um, the, traffic inc the traffic counts and the impact of these projects. So um, thanks to the feedback from, from, your, from you all, um, that is getting a fresh look and wanted to share that uh, update with you. Um, yeah, so that's the impact uh, or the, the update on uh, traffic. Um, and that's kind of all we'll say about it right now. Um, it's not really gonna be the focus of this meeting. It's happening sort of in a, in a separate um, uh, effort outside of the, this project. Um, however, we're coordinating with them and we'll be submitting the traffic uh, report um, back to the city along with the, this project. Okay, um, now let's, let's start talking about uh, the playground design. This is sort of the meat and potatoes of this pre presentation and where we wanna focus our attention tonight. Um, as you look at this aerial, this is looking north um, and it's this area, Andrew, can you nod? You can see my mouse, right? So it's this area right in here on the property. So here's the Atherton tributary and here's Ridge Point Drive. And then there's the church property to the north. Um, so we're going to be talking about this, this kind of area right, right in here as we get into it. So, Okay, this is the plan that we last looked at together in early October. Um, and you can see there's a little uh, uh, delineation of a playground up here. And this is the plan we last looked at and, and that we thought we could afford uh, in, a, in a playground scenario like that. But at that point, there were some unknowns about the skate park, basketball courts, playground, some of these different things that we just didn't know for sure what our direction was ultimately gonna be. So um, just as sort of a, a starting point, this is, this is the last published plan that, that you may recall looking at. Um, and I'll get into this a little bit more, but, and then on the left, you can see there, um, these are really the four defining features of the park that we've heard during the outreach early on in particular, um, things that were important to the community, walking paths, natural features, maximizing the athletic field in here. And we also heard maximizing the play area um, uh, as well on the site. So that's really what we're going to focus on today and particularly that, <laughs> that last one. So here's a here's a, a zoomed in look at the play area um, from early October, and uh, again this was a little bit of a placeholder until we really had a little bit better direction on things. Um, but some of what we heard was this. So this is the play, or, or excuse me, the um, picnic shelter, and this was the uh, restroom over here. And some of what we heard was. Um, that the picnic shelter was too small and it'd be great if it was a little bit bigger. Um, and as a re reminder for this concept, the, the brown area really indicates sort of a play, play area with boulders and logs and nets and things like that, sort of a more natural character. And then in blue is more of, um, uh, this would be like a rubberized uh, play surfacing with a play structure and a swing and some different things. But really the critical play area was kind of over here on this side. Again, in early October, this is uh, a couple of the design drivers for that play area that we heard from the community that was important to the project. One was have inclusive, make the playground inclusive. So everybody has the opportunity to have fun here. And you can see from these images, some of the things that drive that. And, and one, one thing we'll talk about a little bit today is the surfacing uh, can go a long way in making a playground inclusive, as well as the type of play elements um, as well. So that was one, one thing we've been looking at as we've developed the playground area. Um, a second thing is natural elements. Um, the, the park, we've heard over and over again that the natural character of the park is important. And to preserve that as much as we can and to bring that into kind of all the decisions we're making. So you can see from these images, some, some of these are you know, creative ways to have fun with natural components and others are just like kind of let nature be, you know, let, let kids explore in nature and see, see what happens. So we've tried to work that into the design if we've been looking at the last couple of weeks. 
We've also heard that a play structure would be really great for this park. Um, and so here's some images we shared in October for what that could be like. And then uh, lastly, uh, freestanding play elements, things like swings and uh, things you can climb on. And, um, you know, maybe they have some auditory value or uh, what be it, but just a variety of things for kids to do and have fun with. Um, so that was early October, and then we went to council, and council gave us some direction on the skate park, and we started to recraft how some of this stuff set on the site. And then in January, we got some really good input from some students. Um, so I want to go through this, and this is thanks to um, Kirsty Riley, who uh, took this to the elementary schoolers at Westridge and Palisades Elementary School, and they developed over 100 uh, drawings to share with the city and about what would be fun on this playground. So if we take a quick look at this, um, Audrey, who is nine and three quarters years old, uh, thought it would be so cool if the new playground had a huge rock wall and lots of different size, um, uh, different sizes, a tree house and a zip line. Chelsea, age seven, thought it would be really cool to have a very tall slide and a bridge and water under the bridge. And Tesla, who had a lot of enthusiasm for this assignment, said her favorite thing to do on a playground is the swings, uh, play tag, spinny things, seesaws. August uh, suggested that a spider web, one of those big spider web nets, a rock wall would be great. Isla suggested that tunnels, slides, swings are all a lot of fun. And Bowden suggested uh, a bird thing that you can climb up and the rock wall that you can climb on to get at the bridge. So that was really great feedback. And I am so glad um, and thankful to Kirsty for taking that to the elementary schoolers. So we have some firsthand feedback on what would be great for this project. So these are some of the things that emerged from, if you summarize uh, kind of what we heard uh, of all those, those fun drawings is things like these grass, Grassy areas, a tunnel, swings, rock wall, bridges, slides, water, zip line, all those really fun things. So um, we got that feedback just last, or I guess it's March now, so two months ago. Um, and that was really great to hear. And um, so then the other thing that we've been doing uh, as well is comparing, you know, finding out how, how big are the other playgrounds in Lake Oswego. So we can get a sense of, you know, how we stack up against some of these other playgrounds. So for a quick comparison, right across the street at Hazelia Park, you've got um, a playground that's about 2,000 square feet, and it looks like this. Um, at Free Ponds Park, you have a playground that has a, a structure and some free play uh, equipment, and it's also about 2,000 square feet. Over at Glen Marie, a 2,000 square foot playground and uh, a significant um, play structure here. Over at Westridge Park, it's almost 5,000 square feet and there's several pieces of equipment that you can see there. Over at Westlake, um, you have a shaded play area and it's also almost 5,000 square feet. George Rogers is one of the larger ones at 12,000 square feet and East Waluga is about 15,000 square feet uh, at that playground. Okay, so with that in mind, these are, these are five sort of things that we've done to sort of improve or develop and adapt the playground since last time we shared it with you. So number one, we made it bigger uh, than, than previously shown. Number two, we took that direction from the primary users, the, the kids at the elementary schools. Um, we worked hard to keep a natural character. We're prioritizing inclusivity in the design and uh, we're including play structures and free play elements. Okay, so how did, how did we do that? Um, I wanna kind of walk you through the process a little bit. Um, so, the first thing we did uh, when we heard we wanted uh, more play, play space and maybe a bigger shelter, we took this picnic shelter and we just moved it over to the east and we moved the restroom over to the east as well. And what that did was um, it allowed us to develop all of this space 
up here as play area. So if, if you follow my mouse here, this whole space, if you include this grass, which is fun to play on, all of that is a, almost 15,000 square feet of playground area. So it's more than double um, what we saw last time when we shared that last concept with you. So it's gotten significantly bigger and we've, we've started to drill into what it could be and what features it has. Um, and so I wanna talk about that in a second. Over here on the far right, um, you'll see this is the picnic shelter, which we've slid over and it now uh, has gotten bigger. And you can see these are picnic tables that accommodates probably six to eight picnic tables. We haven't really sorted out the configuration exactly yet, but um, we're showing seven there at the moment. But um, the picnic shelter is over here. So it's bigger and it opens up a kind of with a view across the playground, if you will. Okay, so what is going on in this playground? You see a whole bunch of funny shapes and a lot of different colors. See if I can uh, explain the, the approach here. So the, play, the playground is broken into different groups or different pods that sort of hang off of this accessible path. So this path down the middle is um, fairly flat. So really anybody can access these different play areas. There's no barriers to entry. Um, Right here in the middle uh, is the play structure, and that's kind of central. It's kind of right on axis. If you're driving in, you can see it. Um, and so that's kind of the play structure area. And then as you go this way, there's uh, play elements in here. There's natural play in here, more play elements over here. There's a lawn over here that you can play in. And then little kids can play over here, kind of closer to the shelter um, where their parents may be you know, getting some shade or, or having lunch or whatever it is and has a good relationship there. So we've created these different groups of uh, play areas um, based on that. Okay, so what are the play elements that are going on here? Um, starting with the structure again, this is, this is the play structure. These are climbing walls of uh, various abilities and um, challenge and difficulty. And I'll, I'll show you more about that in a minute. This is a slide over here. Um, this is a swing uh, in this area. Uh, these are boulders and, and logs and nets, uh, more of a natural feel here. Um, this is a bridge that connects these two, just a bridge that's just barely off the ground, not like a high thing or anything, but. Um, connects these two areas here. This is a spinner. Uh, and then these are sort of to be determined exactly what they are, but smaller free play elements. Um, and then this is sort of a tactile wall, um, if you will. So if you're running down this ramp, it's something to kind of run your hand over, or maybe it has some color to it and it's kind of special and fun. And then lastly is the top play area, a place for toddlers to kind of dink around a little bit. So those are broadly some of the play elements that we're thinking about. Um, what about the natural elements? Um, so the play structure, we we'll talk about how that uh, has sort of a natural feel to it. This is a boulder wall, this gray uh, shape here where you could, could climb on that and have fun. Um, this is kind of more of an, a natural play area based on the materiality of it. Um, and then trees and plants kind of weave their way through the whole play area. So you have trees and planting kind of on the border, but you also have this kind of big trees and planting move here that sort of separates the, the primary walkway with some of the play space and helps separate the grade a little bit. Um, and then some more plants that kind of come through here. So trying to carefully bring natural features into the active play areas. Um, uh, as well as just using natural materials as much as we can um, throughout the play area. So inclusivity. Um, so how is this um, playground design? How is it inclusive? So inclusivity is a really broad topic and it, include, it, in, it may include people in wheelchairs or that have mobility challenges, but it can also include people that are sight impaired or have auditory challenges. There's a lot of people of a variety of um, impairments that we might not normally think about. So there's a lot to be considered here when it comes to um, not only surfacing and slopes, but also color and 
challenge level of challenge for um, the play space. Um, so the goal is to make it as, as accessible as possible to the most amount of people as possible. So some of the things you can see in the text there that um, we've been paying attention to that aren't quite obvious yet um, in the presentation are number one, the, the slopes. Um, all of the, this is fairly flat, I mentioned, but uh, imagine this imagine this sort of rises up slowly around the backside to where you're maybe seven or eight feet above this blue surface. And I'll show you what that looks like in a second, but it's a gradual slope is the point on this slide, a gradual slope that allows everybody to be able to make that, um, uh, that climb, if you will, and uh, then back down the other side. Um, the play elements uh, are also accessible. So things like a, a basket swing, we saw an image of that earlier in one of the slides, that would happen here. Um, this is an accessible spinner, which is what well, when we grew up, it was uh, uh, a merry-go-round. Now they call them spinners and they're a little more um, user-friendly for everybody. Um, so the equipment is is more is is anticipated to be ex highly accessible, um, and then lastly the surfacing. So uh, the transition between different surfaces is important, but also the fall surfacing um, around play equipment needs to be firm enough that you can you know run a wheelchair over it or or cross over it, but soft enough that if you fall off um, it it kind of breaks the fall. So the two surfaces that you're looking at here, um, which we're still developing as, as time goes here, are um, one, uh, there's three. Um, this green one is like a synthetic lawn. So that would be, um, you know, you can kind of picture that, the synthetic lawn as sort of a green uh, mat around that. Um, so that's what you see here and what you see here. And then in the blue, that's a, a, a rubberized tile um, type of product. And um, that also has a really uh, critical um, uh, level of bounce to it if you fall off the equipment um, and, you know, preserves you. So we're still, we're still um, you know, studying that as we go here. That's something we'll study more as we get into the construction documents, but those are two of the types of surfacing that we expect to employ in this playground. The third one is this bark chip area, and we all can imagine what bark chips look like, but um, bark chips are can be accessible, but um, sometimes if they fall into um, um, an unmaintained state, it can be a little more tricky to um, uh, move uh, a wheelchair, um, a mobility device through there. So it's a little little more challenging for some people, but it still can um, have great um, surfacing value. Okay, so you've been looking at this plan and you're like, I, I still don't get it. I, I just see funny shapes. Well, I got a couple of sketches that hopefully will explain it a little bit more. So imagine you're standing right here, looking kind of out to the north where those red arrows are pointing. And this is kind of what you would see here. So you have the play structure right in the middle and then with the big slide that comes out and then here's that boulder wall. So imagine, you know, you just had your soccer game and you're over here eating lunch and then it's time to go play and you can run out into the blue area. Uh, and then you can run down this uh, gently sloping path and you can run your hand on this, this uh, wall, whatever it ends up being. It might be wood or something tactile or, have some auditory value to it as well. And you run up and you can climb up the nets in this play structure, which is 20 feet tall. You can climb up it, you can slide down and you jump off and you come over to the rock wall and you can climb up this rock wall and it's more challenging in the middle. Um, and then it sort of, sort of uh, curves and, and flattens out this way as the slope gets a little bit less. So maybe there's a different material here in brown, maybe that's wood and it has handholds. So it's not quite as challenging as the boulders. And then maybe you're the toddler over here and there's just a little bit of gain. And so maybe that's the rubberized surfacing and there's handholds and the risk is much less. There's sort of a lower pad here and a little bit upper pad here. And we would think to uh, separate that by maybe 
boulders or something like that. That's sort of a natural material that sort of breaks these two spaces up a little bit. You could be running around this back ramp uh, along the top here, and then you get to the top and you can kind of see out a little bit and then you come over to a second slide. Maybe you're not ready for this big slide, but here's a smaller slide that kind of comes down this way. Or you can just make the loop. You can come out this side and, and return that way. Or maybe you come in here and you decide to use the ropes to help you up the boulder wall a little bit. Um, so there's really a variety of different um, challenges and experiences um, in this, this play area. This, this tree in the back is important because it's an existing pine tree. And we've tried to design around that because we think it's um, not only a good buffer to the northern property, but it helps to express that natural character that we've been, been trying to do and that we've heard from the community is really valuable. So we're kind of designing around that um, and using that um, as sort of an added benefit to, to what it brings to this play area. And then you can see there's uh, a whole planted strip kind of here between the, the walkway and uh, the play area. And that would be, um, you know, full of a variety of different types of plants. It's no doubt going to have kids running in and out of it. So it looks like one, you know, continuous barrier now, but uh, rest assured there'll be little ways for kids to traipse in and out and back and forth through that. But um, that's a whole nother study in terms of, um, you know, the value of, uh, of the actual landscape in a play area and the tactile quality and the visual quality and the, um, the, the smells that um, the plants can give off as well. So this is um, the area to the north. And now I'm going to flip over to the opposite side. So pretend you climbed up the tower uh, and you're looking to the south and you would see something that looks like this. So let's say hey, you were- hey, Stephen, Stephen, can I interrupt you for a second? Yeah. Your, your, your narrative is not in line with your mouse. <laughs> it's hard to follow. <laughs> so you either need to slow down your talking or speed up your mouse. Okay, thank you. <laughs> you want me to go back to the beginning? <laughs> okay, thanks, for, thanks, Bruce. I appreciate that. Okay, so from, from the left here, uh, this is what I was calling the spinner, uh, and it's sort of, uh, sort of that merry-go-round sort of um, uh, a piece of equipment here, but it's the, the, the difference being it's easier to transfer into and out of for people of different abilities. So it has this big green area around it um, that is, is what I was describing as the surfacing. So in this case, um, it'd be that synthetic lawn in this area which has that nice firmness, but is also kind of safe to fall on, if you will. So if you're doing the spinner, then maybe you could go to the swing by crossing over this bridge, and the bridge sort of crosses this planted area um, that bisects the two areas uh, here. So you get over to the basket swing, and the basket swing um, is, is, again, that um, image we looked at earlier for that's easy to transfer in and out of and would be a lot of fun. Um, and if you're mom and dad, maybe you are using this picnic table right in the middle and you have eyes kind of at all directions and you, you feel really comfortable being able to watch your kid, you know, run in any direction. Um, the trees in the far background, that's the Atherton tributary area. There's a picnic table kind of on the back end of that. This brown surfacing is what we were looking at as the bark chips, um, and that would be those sort of boulders and logs and nets and things. And then on the south side of the play area, you have these kind of taller columns, and those would be sort of tall logs that help sort of imply um, a little bit of closure to that side of the park and or playground and help people know, you know, that's where the play area stops and you want to kind of stay on this side of it. Okay, so again, here's another view of that. Maybe this view makes a little bit more sense now after that, those illustrations and that conversation, um, but this is, this is the plan. Um, this play structure right here that I've talked about a couple of times, um, I'll show you an image of that next. So here's the play structure we hope to include for the project. And like I said, it's it's got some mass. It's about 20 feet tall. So you'd really notice it when you arrive at the park. 
Um, but it has that kind of natural character to it with these log legs, these tall, long legs um, that support the structure. And you can see there's climbing nets inside of it. So you can kind of climb up to it and go down the slide. OK, um, next thing I want to talk about is the shelter. So we've heard some feedback over the last couple of months that um, maybe this shelter was too small, you know, four picnic tables. Maybe that's not quite what we hoped for. Could we do something a little bit bigger? So you can see this is about 600 square feet and it fit about four tables. And as I alluded to earlier, we made it a little bit bigger and it looks like it'll fit about six to eight tables. And you can see it's 360 square feet larger than previously. So, um, so it's definitely a little bit bigger, um, which would accommodate the sort of post athletic game uses, which I think would be really cool. Um, as far as the design of it, um, one thing uh, about the, the roofs, the roof form is it sort of opens up um, to the front here, which allows kind of um, that view over the playground and lets some of that later afternoon sunlight into uh, the shelter area. And it's open on all sides, which allows for good visibility in any direction, which we think has a lot of value as well. The materials of it, um, you can see sort of a dark metal and that's intended to sort of reseed um, and not really stand out. We don't not using bright, vibrant colors, but more in keeping with the desire to let the natural aesthetic of the park sort of stand out and be less about the structure. So those colors hopefully will recede a little bit and not, not be really um, overwhelming or anything. The underside of it is wood, as you can see, which speaks to that natural character we've been, been talking about. So you might be wondering, why do we have a shed roof? Um, why, does, why does it take that shape? Well, the answer is what you're looking at here. We, we need, we have um, several structures on the property and we're trying to create a family of structures that have a similar pitch to them, similar colors, um, and really aren't the main thing. We want the, the structures on the property to sort of reseed and not really call a lot of attention to themselves, but we do want them to be handsome structures and relate to one another. So you can see, you know, a dugout, we can all imagine and picture it has sort of a, just a natural pitch to it, the shelter um, that we were just looking at. And then um, there's a maintenance building on the property as well, and then the restroom. And so the intent, um, which we're hopefully we're demonstrating here, is to use a similar material palette and um, form and structure to, uh, to each of these so that they, they relate to each other. Okay, so, um, and where are those structures? So here's the shelter, which I mentioned earlier. Um, this is the maintenance building, um, which is largely in the same spot it was um, a couple months ago. And then this is the restroom structure, which we slid over, used to be kind of over here. Um, and then you can see the dugouts associated with uh, the baseball field as well. And then uh, just to highlight some of the picnicking areas um, as you move throughout the site, um, we've really spread them out um, along the, the west end of the field here and then down uh, even down in, into the southern area. So if you've got a baseball game uh, down here and there's a post game you know, wanting to eat lunch down here, then that's a really easy opportunity to do that. So we've added a, a handful of picnic tables throughout the property to accommodate that. And with that, I'm going to turn it back over to Jen. And uh, Jen and Andrew will start fielding questions if there's any. Great. Thank you, Stephen. I really appreciate that. Um, so now is when we would love to hear from you, any comments you have, any questions you have, and it, we can utilize the chat function, you can utilize the Q&A, um, or just raise your hand using the raise hand function at the bottom of your screen, that will let us know, and I can see we already have two hands up, the first one I see is Mario. All right, good evening. Uh, 
Yeah, thanks again. You guys have, it uh, seems like you guys have really heard the community that uh, I represent out here in Palisades neighborhood where the park is going to be going into. And um, I'm getting a lot of feedback from the neighbors being really happy with that. Um, just a couple points that we were hoping to add um, on that picnic shelter. Uh, it has become quite large and um, some items that I think you guys have heard on the last meeting um, that need, wanted me to uh, communicate was a sink of some sort um, and counter space. Um, and then any addition of some type of at least uh, not, maybe not a full wall, but a, um, some type of partition to uh, continue helping to keep uh, weather elements out of the shelter um, during those rainy times. You know, maybe not all the way around, but two or three of the sides. So you can hear my kiddo excited about the park too. <laughs> but yeah, so those are the, those are the couple elements that I uh, wanted to communicate or convey. Great, thank you, Mario. Um, Stephen, Andrew, I don't know if you all, if you want to respond or just kind of take that feedback in. Um, no, thanks for the feedback, Mario. Yeah, I appreciate it. Okay, it looks like I have a few other hands up. The next one I see is Ruth. Okay, can you hear me? We can, thank you. Okay. I just had some comments about the shelter. Um, and I, my name is Ruth Bregar and I'm the co-chair of the uh, Westridge Neighborhood Association. I, uh, I kind of echo what Mario had to say. Um, while you, while I, I appreciate the fact that the roof is slanted and goes along with the other um, structures uh, on the, in the area. I th think, and that you wanna catch the afternoon sun I have concerns about uh, young kids and maybe baby people who don't want the sun and people who might seek shelter from the sun. And I'm wondering whether a pitched roof or a gable roof that I think you could, it could be designed that would tie in and complement the other, uh, the, the um, restroom roof and the other roof, um, which would offer more um, protection from the elements. And uh, I also think you need to have um, gutters and downspouts. Uh, it looks like the, the design and the original design is a little bit slanted and if it's rainy, all that water is just gonna fall off on that one side. So um, that's all I just, I would like to see a, a little more protection from the, from the weather. And I think a pitched gabled roof would do that. Thank you. Thank you, Ruth. I appreciate you thinking through that. Um, and again, Stephen and Andrew, just let me know. Pipe up if you want to respond. Otherwise, I'll just kind of call on the next person. Sure, great, great feedback. Appreciate it, Ruth. Um, and a good eye on the downspouts. That's something we'll definitely be picking up uh, as we we continue to develop here. But appreciate the comment about shade and, and weather protection. Yeah, thank you. Looks like next I have um, Kirsty. Hi there, can you hear me okay? Yeah, we can. Okay, great. Uh, hi, it's Kirsty Riley and I'm on the PNA board and I'm also a mother of two boys at Westridge. Um, first, we just want to really thank you and the city for the increased space allocation and the budget. You know, it's we really appreciate being heard. And, um, you know, by the looks of the changes, this is going to be a real jewel uh, in our community. So we're, we're really grateful for that. Um, and also thank you for including the kids drawings. That was it was a really, you know, fun um a project to do with the kids and they've been really excited that they feel like they've been heard and represented um so that's really cool um my kids were asking about the zip line it, that that was definitely an item that that seemed to crop up a lot in the kids drawings and i don't know if it's too late to to do something like that um 
But I just want to say that we think that the layout is absolutely fantastic. The um, the board, the boulder climbing wall, and how it's embedded into the landscape, the teardrop shape. I, I really like how since the the last meeting when this was presented that you've included the full um, circle around. I think that in itself is going to be so great for kids to be able to you know just do loops around you know kids of any age. Um, I uh, wanted to just speak about two kind of main points um, that seem opposite, but actually all, all speak to having an inclusive playground. The um, accessibility is really great. I've, I've spoken to some uh, neighbors in Palisades that have children with special needs and I've showed them the updates and they're really excited about the surfacing and the accessibility to get to these areas. One question was asked with the spinner is if the spinner will be um, level to the ground instead of raised slightly above the ground. So kind of sunk into the ground so that it's truly accessible. And even somebody with you know a wheelchair can just roll right onto the spinner. And if also there would be some kind of a seat in there. So, you know, a child perhaps um, with some mobility issues could sit on that spinner. Um, so those were two things that came directly from the community. Um, and also the other question I have is in regards to the natural area, um, are some of those elements going to be a little bit more challenging so that this part can also be fun for kids that are say 10 and older. Um, you know, some of the, the wood elements and the net elements, are they gonna be very low to the ground or are they gonna be higher for kids, um, you know, that want that extra challenge? Um, the other thing that I wanted to ask is if there was any kind of possibility to have some music incorporated into it, in, like for example, in the tactile wall, could that have some kind of musical element? Um, you know, there's there's a company in particular, uh, Percussion Play, that specializes in really amazing, uh, you know, just soft, natural musical elements. That would be a, that would be a fantastic spot for it. Um, lastly, uh, a request from my son. <laughs> Um, is would it be possible to have some chess boards painted on some of the picnic tables? I know we've got a big chess community here. Uh, it also seems like it could be something that maybe the residents at the Stafford could come and use while the kids were at school. So those were all my notes, um, but overall, I just want to say we love the direction that it's going in and we're eager to kind of find out what some of the specific elements are going to be like um, the uh, where the natural area is and the orange dots, um, but but thank you. We we are delighted in the direction that it's going. Great, thank you so much, Kirsty, for those comments and also questions. Uh, Stephen, I don't know which one you want to address first, but I can I can help queue up uh, all the questions as well. <laughs> well, yeah. Um, first of all, yeah, thank you, Kirsty, very much. I I really admire and appreciate that you took the challenge to uh, take this to the the grade schools and get their input. And I was happy to have a chance to see that and and hear what some of the kids were uh, aspiring to. Um, I think that's fantastic. And if you, I'll just um, if if you think it would be fun or valuable. Um, for myself or my team to come in, into your school and kind of um, do a second version to sort of share how this is developed. Um, I'd be happy to do that. I would, I'd love to to be able to share this with the kids. Um, wow, I, I mean, that would be great. I, I can, you know, would absolutely love to help facilitate that and get you in touch with the principal or, you know, help organize that. That'd be great. Yeah, that, that'd be super fun. Um, great comments, great um, observations. Um, so first thing, spinner accessibility, it is above ground. Um, what we're thinking, if you've been to Gateway Discovery Park in Northeast Portland, that's the type of spinner um, that we're thinking. Um, but to your point uh, a little bit later, yeah, we I didn't mention this, but we haven't picked the specific equipment yet for most of these things. The structure where we sort of honed in on a little bit, but 
Um, this has been mostly about the concept and the layout and some of those other things first. So we'll get into that. And those are that's all good feedback. The auditory um, thing, the music, the chess boards, all of that we'll keep in mind as we kind of charge ahead with this. Um, so all of that equipment, uh, TBD, but um, I can tell you the intent is, is to choose all of that equipment um, in sort of with a, a lens of inclusivity and, and knowing that it's a variety of kids coming to this play space. Some are young, some are older. Uh, some need challenge, some need easy. Some need uh, color, some need uh, you know natural muted color. Some need um, a place of respite and some, some kids need a place of excitement. So it's really a broad spectrum of users and uh, we have that in mind. And as we kind of go to the next level, we'll we'll be considering all of that stuff, so. Yeah, well, and I think, you know, the the way that you've created the layout, um, it, that that in itself just makes it feel very accessible and inclusive. And so, yeah, we're just excited to see and if we can be involved or have input on the specific elements, you know, we would love that. Um, and I guess my final question would be for that natural element, some of those boulders, would they potentially be, you know, large or are they just more, you know, four feet tall or would they be larger than that? Yeah, I like that idea. And um, we haven't um, we haven't really figured how this stuff is going to going to go together, really zeroed in on that. But it will have different levels of challenge, like you suggested. The boulders. Yeah. Um, uh, maybe I think what you're saying is bigger is better is more fun. Um, and so we, we hear yeah, that. I, yeah. I mean, like at Foothills Park, right? There's, there's, it's a beautiful park, but as far as, you know, a kids playground area, there's not much there, but you know, my boys want to go there specifically for that climbing rock. Um, mm -hmm. And so we go to Foothills Park just to spend an hour climbing that rock. Um, you know, and I, and I even climb it. So <laughs> you're talking about know. like, involving the whole family and, you know, families recreating together. I think, um, you know, that's what Rasik Park is going to be all about, right? With the skate park, the field, everything. And so if those elements within um, these different sections of the playground can speak to that as well, and of course, also including children who might have, you know, some special needs, I, I think that would be great if we could kind of, you know, check all those boxes, which it, it looks like the potential is totally there. So that's great. Great, thank, thank you. Um, I do see Mario elevated the, the question again, is zip line still in the discussion? <laughs> yes. Someone needs to know. <laughs> what are your thoughts, Stephen, on the zip line? Uh, the zip line can still be in the discussion. Yeah, you're right. We, do, we aren't showing it um, currently. Maybe uh, Kirstie or Mario, you'd like to elaborate when you say zip line, um, two things, two different mental pictures come to mind. There's like the the play structure type where it's kind of got two ends to it and you kind of zip down and it's sort of built for you. When I heard zip line, I'm thinking like flying out of a tree and going a hundred yards zip line. So what do you guys mean when you say zip line? Well, as an um, adult, that's, that's what I'm picturing too. <laughs> <laughs> I, I, I mean, you know, I think um, not not the first one that you said, but some variation of the second option. I mean, obviously we want it to be safe, so it's not going to be coming from the trees, you know, 10 feet in the air, but, you know, something maybe where it is like a traditional zip line, but they'd have to like lift their legs so it would still be safe you know, if they needed to put their legs down, obviously we don't want something that is dangerous or they'd need a harness or anything like that. But something, you know, I think Oregon kids are, are you know, adventurous. <laughs> um, and so if there was an element of that, that just made this park special, instead of the traditional, you kind of hang on the thing and you go from point A to point B, mm -hmm. you know, on the same level. Um, you know, I don't know if that could come off the, um, you know, the, the, the main structure. I mean, I think the main structure here is, is an opportunity is kind of a showstopper. Um, so I don't know if the zip line could be incorporated there or if it would be more in the natural area. Um, but yeah, I think something where it might not be dangerous, but if the kids lift their legs up, it feels a little dangerous. Yeah. Or adventurous, let's put it. <laughs> yeah. 
I, you know, I talked to, um, I talked to Ivan about this and, you know, I, he mentioned that he knows of some parks, not necessarily in Oregon, but where they do have this. And it did seem like there was a possibility where it could still be something that's not particularly dangerous, but still, you know, thrilling. So he might have some more input on, on what that could look like. Well, you're, I mean, you guys are definitely onto something, uh, with, um, you know, there's the balance between risk and danger and fun. And, and I think, I think what you're saying is that's what you're hoping for, you know, because different kids experience fun in different ways and different levels of risk. So, yeah. And I think, you know, when you're looking at, you know, modern playgrounds, I think what we're trying to do is give kids a sense of what, what we had when we were kids, right. When yeah. we could just, you know, go through our neighborhoods and natural spaces for, you know, hours on end unsupervised, you know, we don't do that anymore, but we still want our kids to have those gross motor skills to, to have those challenges. Um, and I, you know, and I think with the way that you've designed the space, we have the opportunity to give kids that. Yeah, thank you. I want to I want to elevate really quick. Um, Taryn, it looks like Taryn also said I've seen one in South Lake, Texas. The only downside is it took lots of space. I just want to elevate that comment too. And then hey, I, I think I interrupted someone. Yeah. Yeah, and this is Jeff. So yeah. this is Jeff with Lake Oswego Parks. Uh, just anything we do playground wise has to meet the ASTM standards. So we can we can only go so risky and still meet the the, the safety and the risk factor that the city has to take into consideration. So. I mean, we, we have a, a track ride at East Beluga Park. It's just, you know, it's probably only about, you know, 10 or 15 feet long and it's level. The kids climb up, they grab a handle, they slide down. Uh, it's, it's not a big zip line by any means, but I'm not sure a zip line will meet the standards that we have to uh, take into consideration when we install that stuff. Yeah, yeah thank you, Jeff, for, yeah, for containing this discussion a little bit. We want to make sure that it's safe and, and within the standards uh, by the city. Let me let me just move on and see if there are other folks. I don't see any other hands, but I want to just open up the opportunity if there's anyone else who wants to use the raise hand function or put any comment um, in the chat so that we know you'd like to make a comment and speak. Great, looks like um, Al. Uh, sorry, can you hear me? We can, yeah. I apologize for being late um, and just wanted to thank you. And I, and I, because I just joined, unfortunately, I don't know where we are in the meeting, but uh, are you taking public comment right now or are you making presentation? Thanks for the question. No, this is our Q&A portion. So comments, questions are all welcome. Okay, well, I, I'm again, I'm sorry that I that I wasn't there, but uh, at the beginning, but um, I did want to uh, thank you all for your work. Uh, as as you have heard, probably from others by now, uh, the Palisades Neighborhood Appreci uh, Association appreciates that uh, changes have been made to the park design and um, and specifically with regard to allocating um, more uh, square footage to the things that we valued uh, in the neighborhood, which was a result of our survey, which specifically had to do with um, uh, family uh, activities and uh, and the playground. Um, so I, I want to start with that. And I, and I look back on our association statement, which seems like we wrote it um, a year or two or three ago, and it turns out it was it was back in June, I believe, when we first did. And I went back on that just to just to reflect on on where we've come, and uh, we we as I mentioned we do appreciate what's been done to to uh, I think listen to the needs of our neighbors because when I I try to report in a way that it is not my personal opinion but what um, what feedback we've had from our neighbors, uh, and so I think we've made some good progress on a couple of things. A couple of things have been promised, and uh, we. we they're still important to us. Um, things like the stewardship of Pecan Creek and um, and the wildlife corridor protection of that, especially with the um, the design of the parking and the access being so close. Um, we still have 
uh, residual. I'm not going to beat this drum very loudly, but uh, we still have a fairly sizable concern about the access. Uh, to my knowledge, nothing has been changed about the access on Atherton, which we've had strong uh, feedback from our neighbors uh, who live right around there that uh, this is uh, this is not something that they are happy about. Uh, and similarly, of course, we have the ongoing concern about traffic. And I'm not a betting man, but if I were, I would say that uh, it it uh, would not require an extensive and ex an expensive market survey from um, a consultant to predict with some degree of certainty that we are going to have a very unpleasant traffic situation, uh, both during and after the construction. That's all I had to say. Thank you so much. I appreciate all the work you're doing. Thank you, Al. Um, uh, to respond to a couple of those things, I uh, appreciate you bringing them up. Um, the, we did talk, we, we did briefly update on um, the, the group on the traffic study um, before you're able to join. And that is to say that the city has heard the comments and concerns about Stafford and the roundabout. And they've uh, went ahead and taken another look at the uh, the numbers and taking the traffic counts into consideration and um, making sure that they have the, the right information and um, the right assessment of uh, the traffic volumes on the, the roundabout and Stafford. Um, and so there, that is ongoing and it's nearly uh, complete. Uh, it'll be done in a couple of weeks here and it will be uh, submitted with our land use application for the park. Um, and I hear what you're saying about um, the access off of Atherton. Um, that is the, the, the case is the same in that we need to follow the direction uh, put forth from engineering, how we need to address um, access to the site. Um, and they'll, they'll take a look at it as we submit and let us know if there's a different direction we need to, to take on that. Um, and uh, about the creek, yes, we will be protecting the creek. Um, uh, as well, and there's a, a 10 foot buffer as we go into construction, and we are staying um, out of that for all development. So the creek will be protected. Thank you. Great. And it looks like we have a couple of comments in the chat. Um, the first is from RJ. Uh, it says, not playground related, but how many parking spaces are currently needed for the skate park? status of the traffic study, when is the earliest possibility that it would begin? Five years um, at the earliest for the county to make improvements on the roundabout. Any plans for the city to deal with the impacts um, of all of its projects? So I think, again, asking about the traffic study um, and then the count for the number of parking spaces for the skate park. Um, the I'd have to go back, Rick, and check exactly the Parking count, you'll have to excuse me, it's um, uh, uh, around 65 to 68 for the park as a whole. And um, how many are currently allocated for the skate park? Um, there are, uh, there's a certain amount of that. I'd have to go back and check the parking study um, that is allocated for the development of that. So we haven't forgot about that. And maybe that's the concern and the question. We haven't forgotten about the, um, needing to, to provide parking for uh, the skate park. That's a part of the, the count. Um, and then as far as the traffic study, um, I, don't, I don't have any update on, on those particular questions other than what I shared earlier for the traffic study. Great, thank you, Stephen. Um, also see a comment um, that says, sorry, just wondered how much will this project cost? Um, I'll answer the one about the skate park lights and then Ivan, I don't know if you want to answer the one about the, the park cost. Um, the skate park is, uh, of course, in design. If there's a question or desire to have lights at the skate park, um, that April 2nd meeting would be a good uh, meeting to go to, but I don't think they've determined that yet. Currently, we don't have it in the plans for lights at the skate park. Great, and then I don't know if, if anyone can speak to, to project costs. I'll attempt, this is Ivan. Um, right now we don't, we don't know what the uh, projected costs are. Um, 
as far as we haven't had a cost estimate done since we've made um, some changes to the playground and, and the shelter area. Um, we are anticipating uh, taking a look at what those costs are. Um, and with, with all of our projects, um, we're, we're dealing, especially in the last, I'd say in the last three to four weeks, we're, we're dealing with some uh, volatility in the market, um, especially when it comes to uh, materials having to move from one area to another to get to, get to this area. So we'll, we'll be tracking that very closely. Um, but we don't know um, at this point exactly what the, the ramifications are, um, but we're planning on doing that work. And when we get that work, we'll, we'll take that into account moving forward. So, And then there was one question about the status of the ARPA-funded traffic study. Um, I don't have an update on that particular, but... Um, we definitely can um, find that we are tracking that. And that again is, um, it's not really a traffic study. It's actually a corridor study that will look at um, the entirety of the corridor um, along Stafford from the Rosemont Circle um, all the way down to Highway 43 McVeigh. So, um, but that is uh, something that our council did um, uh, give our engineering department direction to do, and I know that it's on their work plan, but uh, I, I don't know the the uh, actual status of that. Great, thank you, Ivan. Um, I see a question from Mario. What are the four squares on the northeast counter of the drawing above the north dugout? Yeah, good question, Mario. Um, uh, I think you're talking about this right here. If you can see my mouse, that's um, one of the lighting structures that will provide field lighting. Um, so it's set back behind the path right here. So it's just a graphic representation of that. Great. I'm curious for other attendees, if you wanna use the raise hand or put in the chat or Q&A to ask a question or provide any feedback. Well, I'm not seeing anyone so far. I don't wanna cut anybody off from their thought process. So I'm going to take this as kind of last call. Okay, great. So as you saw from the our project timeline, this is to be continued and designed. More information is forthcoming. There's also opportunities um, for you to speak directly to the skate park design. Um, and so I want you to know that there are still opportunities for input um, with all aspects of the park. Oh, and I love, uh, Mario, you had a great last comment. This is becoming an award-winning park that Lake Oswego should be proud of. Mario, I think that that is a wonderful place for us to conclude tonight. Um, I know I am deeply impressed by the way in which community feedback and um, top tier excellent design have been able to come together in this park and create something absolutely magical. Having been here from the beginning, I have to tell you that this is way beyond, um, you know, sort of our wildest dreams for a beautiful and an inclusive playground and a wonderful park. So um, kudos to the project team for, for pushing it and kudos to the community for also providing that excellent feedback and direction. So Stephen, I'll hand it back to you to do our, our sort of final wrap up. Perfect. Thanks, Jen. And um, thanks, everybody that's attended tonight and shown interest and input in the project. And um, we're really excited uh, about the next steps and to um, move this project forward and uh, just really excited about it. Um, as you can see here on the screen, uh, if you have questions about the park, um, Bruce Powers, he's uh, uh, the person that you'd want to get in contact with. And uh, again, the skate park is also moving at a parallel track um, and Kira uh, will be handling that project. So two different people, it's a, it's a park within a park. So um, please uh, continue to you know, share the project with uh, your friends and neighbors. Um, and uh, uh, if you have questions or wanna show them anything, you can send them to these uh, websites. So thank you again and uh, look forward to uh, uh, providing some updates for you in the future. We'll update 
reseekpark.com in short order um, to the latest and greatest plans. So thank you, everybody. Thank you. Have a wonderful night, everyone. Thanks, everyone.